Hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning. Thanks for being here. Uh, before I get started, uh, as some of you have seen reported, uh, I can tell you that later this afternoon, uh, the president will meet with Aung San Suu Kyi uh, at the White House. The president looks forward uh, to her visit as it provides another opportunity to reaffirm our longstanding support for her struggle and the struggle of many others toward democratic, just, and transparent governance in Burma. Uh, this is her first trip to the United States in more than 20 years. Uh, the President very much looks forward to that visit. That's all I have at the top. Uh, late afternoon, around 5 o'clock. Will there be a uh, We're still uh, press coverage TVD, uh, but we'll, we're, we're working on it. Jim. Thanks, Jay. Uh, two foreign policy issues. Uh, Reports that Iran is using Iraqi airspace to uh, deliver weapons to Syria. The issue came up today in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, what steps is the President prepared to take to prevent Iraq from allowing Iran into their air into its airspace? Any uh, conditions on financial aid or anything like that? Well, let me just say broadly that we have made clear to uh, countries around the world uh, that. We all need to work together to prevent uh, Assad from acquiring weapons that he can use to uh, continue to per uh, perpetrate violence against his own people. Uh, and uh, that's a message that we uh, carry in conversations with uh, leaders everywhere. I don't have anything specific for you with regards to Iraq, uh, and I'm not aware of the, uh, uh, of the meeting on the Hill uh, that, uh, that you referenced, but uh, that is uh, something we're concerned about generally. Uh, we've worked very hard with our international partners to uh, cut off access to weapons and financing uh, for Assad, and we continue to do that. On, um, on China, Secretary Panetta returned from his trip there and reported that China's leaders are expressing concern over a U.S. military shift to the, to the Pacific. Uh, does the White House have any concerns that that, together with the attention that China has been getting in the presidential campaign is increasing any tensions with, with the Chinese. What I said yesterday holds true today, which is that we have a very complex, uh, broad relationship with China that is extremely important. And uh, we, uh, when we meet with the Chinese uh, at the level of the president and, and below, uh, we uh, engage with them on all of the issues that uh, are part of our relationship, and that includes areas of disagreement as well as uh, areas of cooperation and agreement. We obviously have an important trade relationship and economic relationship as well as military to military relationship. Uh, we are, as the President made clear on his trip to Asia last fall, a Pacific power. Uh, we have a presence there uh, that's important to the United States and, and to the region, and uh, uh, we intend to uh, pursue that. Uh, but it's, this is about um, uh, you know, broader uh, issues than China. It's, a, it's about the fact that the United States is obviously uh, a Pacific power with Pacific interests, and you know that this President believes that uh, in the eight years prior to him taking office, there was a loss of focus when it comes to Asia uh, by the previous administration uh, because of all the concentrated attention on Iraq in particular. Uh, and he has sought to rebalance our national security, foreign policy, and international economic posture uh, towards uh, Asia for that reason. So the protests in, in China that the U.S. presence has emboldened other countries like Japan on territorial disputes, does the President feel that he want to put your finger on the scale on, on issues like No, look, we believe that good relations between China and Japan uh, benefit everyone in the region. And U.S. policy on the uh, Senkaku Islands, which I think is the issue uh, at the moment, is longstanding and has not changed. The United States does not take a position on the question of the ultimate sovereignty of the islands, and we expect the claimants to resolve the issue through peaceful means among themselves. Uh, Jay, does the President have any reaction to the end of the teacher strike in Chicago yesterday? 
his position uh, has been that uh, he hoped to see both sides in the dispute come together, uh, reach an agreement that could serve and would serve the interests uh, that were paramount, the interests of the children of Chicago, the students in the Chicago school system, and he uh, certainly welcomes resolution to the dispute and welcomes the fact that uh, kids have returned to class this morning. And at the risk of sounding like a broken record, um, oil prices are falling again. Do you have anything updated today to say about the SBR and your thinking about that? I don't. Uh, our thinking remains uh, what it was. I, in regular consultation with our international partners. Uh, we monitor uh, global oil markets and uh, we keep all options on the table to deal with uh, disruptions uh, if necessary, but I have no announcements to make on that. Is there a price level that would change this thinking at all? Of oil prices and or of gasoline prices in this country? Again, Jeff, I, it, it's the kind of thing that I won't get into great specificity on. We simply monitor the situation, uh, mindful of the impact that higher uh, global oil prices have on global economic growth, American economic growth, uh, and uh, mindful of uh, all the various implications that uh, arise when you have a situation like that. But I, you know, I'm not going to get into the details of price levels or reserve levels, uh, and uh, suffice it to say that we, the President, uh, insists that all options for dealing with uh, this issue remain on the table, and that includes the SPR. You mentioned yesterday, just last follow-up on this, that you were pleased about Saudi Arabia's action. Can you talk a little bit about what types of negotiations or discussions happen between the White House or U.S. officials and Saudi officials on this? No, I can simply say that we welcome the Saudi Arabian oil minister's uh, recent remarks and share his concerns about rising uh, oil prices, uh, in broadly speaking, not in recent days, but rising uh, prices in the international oil market. Uh, and we welcome Saudi Arabia's continued commitment uh, to take all necessary steps to ensure the market is well supplied and to help moderate prices. But. You know, we have ongoing con consultations and conversations with uh, our allies and our partners, uh, including uh, Saudi Arabia, on this issue and many others. Okay. In the wake of the uh, attacks in Benghazi, um, the Pentagon and the State Department both made statements that they then had to correct the Pentagon involving whether or not there were Marines at the embassy in Tripoli. Mm -hmm. There were not, and the State Department regarding uh, the presence of security firms at the Benghazi compound. Why was there such confusing, confusion, and is the White House or anyone conducting any sort of internal investigation as to what went wrong? Well, there is an ongoing investigation into what happened in Benghazi that's being led by the FBI. And, uh, and I'm not talking about the criminal act. I'm talking about the, obviously, there wasn't adequate security. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, along the lines of what went wrong, what the administration could have done better. Right. Uh, I, I think I would refer you for questions about security at uh, the Benghazi uh, diplomatic facility and, and broadly speaking at diplomatic uh, facilities, consulates, and uh, embassies around the world to the State Department. Uh, in terms of statements that were corrected by defense or state, I would refer you to those departments. Uh, you know, it, it, from our perspective, we uh, got out to you uh, the information that we had as, as soon as we had it. Uh, and it was available, and uh, our assessment of what happened uh, has been based on the best available information that we've had. There is an ongoing investigation led by the FBI now going back to specifically what happened in Benghazi, uh, and we await the results of that investigation for uh, more information about uh, the, the, the protests and the attacks and what precipitated them and who participated in them with the primary objective here of fulfilling the President's commitment that the uh, that those people responsible for the deaths of four Americans be brought to justice. What reason could there be, or let me, let me rephrase that, who made the decision that there should not be 
Marines in, uh, at our diplomatic posts in, in Libya. More than half of our diplomatic posts have Marines. I understand they're not there to protect people, they're there to protect uh, classified data, but it doesn't hurt to have them there. Who made the decision? Well, I think security at diplomatic facilities is uh, overseen by and run by the State Department, so I'd refer you to them about uh, how decisions are made and what the allocation of resources was uh, in Benghazi and elsewhere. I, I, I think they're the best people to answer that question. Is the President concerned that <laughs> there was a failure by someone in the administration to ensure adequate security measures, whether through The President is concerned that uh, violent actions were taken that led to the deaths of four Americans. You can be sure that he's concerned about that. And he is absolutely concerned that uh, we take the necessary measures to make sure that those who killed Americans are brought to justice. And he has been focused from uh, the beginning on ensuring that adequate security uh, uh, reinforcements be brought to bear at uh, embassies and consulates and diplomatic facilities. Uh, where that's deemed necessary. Uh, again, there's an investigation, I think a broad investigation into what happened and, and how and why uh, in Benghazi, and we course, will that's, that's await the about, results. That's about the perpetrators of the violence. Well, I think it, 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 it encompasses everything that happened. I mean, I'm sure that they will look at everything that happened uh, there. I mean, I, I would refer you to the FBI for, for details, but uh, look, I mean, Jake, I think what happened in Benghazi? of 9-11, an unstable country with roving bands of individuals who are armed, mm -hmm. uh, a, a government that says it, it, it itself cannot provide security, it's not ready to do so yet, and it would just seem not that complicated to discern that there need to be some sort of sec serious security effort there to protect our, our diplomats. Jake, I appreciate the question, and I understand it, and I, and I can simply say that there is an active investigation into uh, what happened in Benghazi that led to the killing of four Americans. And uh, the President uh, has taken action to make sure that we have reinforced security uh, at facilities uh, as deemed necessary uh, and uh, is very focused on ensuring that we bring to justice those who uh, killed Americans abroad. Um, but I, I appreciate your question. I think that, you know, we're, we are uh, awaiting the results of the FBI investigation. Okay, and on one other subject, um, did the President have any response to the Office of Special Counsel report on Secretary Sebelius violating the Hatch Act? Uh, I have not spoken to him about it. I think that Secretary Sebelius has uh, responded to that uh, and uh, made sure that what was an, uh, an ex, you know, her remarks were extemporaneous. Uh, the Health and Human Services Department has since reclassified the event to meet the correct standard. Uh, the U.S. Treasury has been reimbursed, and Secretary Sebelius has met with ethics experts to ensure that this never happens again. The error was immediately uh, acknowledged by the Secretary, and promptly corrected, and uh, no taxpayer dollars were misused. Is it safe to assume that, as far as the President is concerned, that's the end of the matter? Well, I think it's safe to assume that action has been taken by uh, the Secretary and the Department. Uh, to remedy uh, what was, uh, you know, the result of uh, an inadvertent error based on extemporaneous remarks, and, and she uh, acknowledged it immediately, promptly corrected it, and uh, ensured that no taxpayer dollars were used, and that the event, uh, the department reclassified the event to make sure that the correct standards were met. Thanks, Dan. Mm -hmm. Dan. Thank you, Jay. Um, as, aside from the, the FBI investigation, doesn't the White House have its own intelligence that would allow you to say with some degree of certainty that the attack in Benghazi was either a coordinated attack or a spontaneous reaction to the movie? White, White House doesn't have its own intelligence, Dan. The White House has – uh, the White House is the – I mean – Outside of the intelligence community of the United States no, government? Outside of the FBI investigation. You don't have Are you suggesting that we, we have a clandestine intelligence well, operation here in the White House? You were you <laughs> able to find out a lot of information on your own independently. And what I'm saying, in addition to what the FBI is doing, does the White House not have information that it's, it has gathered? I think the FBI about? is leading an investigation that will encompass all of the information available uh, to the White House and to the uh, intelligence community and the broader uh, diplomatic community. What I can tell you is that uh, 
as I said last week, as uh, the, um, our ambassador to the United Nations said on Sunday, and as I said uh, the other day, uh, based on what we uh, know at now and knew at the time, uh, we have no evidence of a pre-planned or premeditated attack. Uh, this, however, remains under investigation, and I made that clear uh, last week, uh, and uh, Ambassador Rice made that clear on Sunday. And if more facts come to light uh, that change our assessment of what transpired in Benghazi and why and how, uh, we will welcome those facts and, and make you aware of them. But again, based on the information that we had at the time and have uh, to this day, we, uh, uh, we, we do not have evidence that it was premeditated. We have, you know, there is, uh, there, it is a simple fact that there are in post-revolution, post-war Libya, uh, armed groups, uh, there are bad actors, hostile to the government, hostile to the West, hostile to the United States. Uh, and uh, as has been the case in other countries in the region, uh, it is uh, certainly conceivable that these groups uh, take advantage of and exploit situations that develop uh, when they develop to um, protest against or attack uh, either uh, Westerners, uh, Americans, Western sites or American sites. And uh, again, this, this is something that's under investigation. We have provided you uh, our assessment based on the information we've had uh, as it's become available. As more information becomes available, uh, we will make you know, clear what, uh, what the investigation has revealed. And another question on Afghanistan, given some of the developments that we've seen there recently. Does the President still believe that the, uh, Afghan forces uh, are capable of handling their own security uh, and will be able to do so uh, in time for the 2014 deadline? The President believes that after a decade of war, uh, we uh, can and should pursue a strategy that transitions security authority over to Afghan forces and allows us to end the war in Afghanistan and bring home our men and women in uniform. That process is underway. Uh, we have gotten to this point because the President, having inherited a policy in Afghanistan that was widely viewed as uh, adrift, without a focused mission, under-resourced, uh, he uh, very deliberately, working with his national security team, uh, honed in on what the proper objectives should be in Afghanistan, uh, made clear that our number one objective in that region was to disrupt, dismantle, and ultimately defeat al-Qaeda, uh, and to ensure, uh, in support of that goal, that Afghanistan could not become a safe haven again uh, for al-Qaeda or uh, other extremists uh, who have as the, their objective attacking the United States or U.S. allies. Uh, and that, the execution of that strategy continues. It, it led initially to a surge in U.S. forces which halted the Taliban's momentum, which allowed us to take the fight to al-Qaeda in the region in a way that we had not been able to before, uh, that led to the decimation of al-Qaeda's leadership, including the elimination of Osama bin Laden, uh, and has now allowed us to draw down uh, the surge forces and to continue the transition to Afghan security forces, uh, responsibility for security of that country. That process continues, as I said the other day. The, we are very concerned about the green on blue attacks that have been taking place in Afghanistan, the increase in those attacks, and our commanders are uh, taking measures to ensure that uh, there is more uh, security for our troops in Afghanistan. Uh, but the process of uh, partnering with and training Afghan security forces continues, and the process of transitioning to Afghan security lead continues. Mm -hmm. And the President has made clear that the pace, uh, the, the, the drawdown of uh, U.S. forces will continue. Uh, the pace of that will depend on evaluations by and assessments by commanders on the ground. Uh, but it will continue, and he uh, remains committed to uh, ending the war in Afghanistan 
in keeping with the NATO objectives by 2014. But does he think they will be prepared to handle their own security? Thanks to the extraordinary sacrifice of our men and women in uniform and uh, our partners, men and women in uniform, uh, we have made tremendous strides towards uh, enhancing the capacity of and the uh, numbers of Afghan security forces. And that remains a fact even as we contend with this uh, serious problem with green on blue attacks. Uh, despite the effort, you know, it, 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 it is true that while we have uh, changed the directives involved in partnering with Afghan forces, it remains true that for a long time now there have been an extraordinary number of missions uh, conducted successfully uh, where uh, U.S. forces or ISAF forces have partnered with Afghan forces and uh, it is essential for Afghans future that Afghan security forces uh, be able to take over security for their country. Uh, it is uh, and it is certainly in the interest of the United States that uh, after a decade of war uh, we continue with that transition uh, in keeping with the President's mission. Bill. There was no evidence of a pre-planned attack. How come? No, let me just repeat now. Well, how again, is it, how is it based the on the information, had RPGs, you know, uh, automatic weapons. Bill, I know words. you've done a little bit of reading about Libya since the unrest that began under Gaddafi. The place is uh, has an abundance of weapons. No question about it. And, Do you expect uh, and the street mob to are, come armed that way? There are uh, unfortunately many uh, bad actors. Uh, in that country, as there are throughout the region, the and they have uh, they're very armed. I'm not. The, the point is, you can make suppositions about what happened. We prefer to have an investigation that looks very closely into what happened uh, and assembles the facts and and presents them. Based on all I'm saying, our people on the ground have seen the fragments of the, the remains of the mortars and the heavy weapons that were used. We're, we made sure <coughs> that there was have, there were, that that there were armed assailants uh, who used heavy weapons. We obviously haven't disputed that. And, and so this is just a random crowd that got together with their heavy weapons, <coughs> got insulted by the film, and decided to go, you know. As I think I just said, there has certainly been precedent in the past where uh, bad actors, uh, extremists who are heavily armed in different countries and different regions of the world have taken advantage of and exploited uh, situations that have developed in order to either attack Westerners or Western assets or American or American assets. That is not. They might or they might not. All I can tell you is based on the information we had at the time, uh, we have now, we do not yet have uh, indication that it was pre planned or premeditated. There's an active investigation. If that active investigation produces facts that lead to a different conclusion, we will make clear that, that that's where the investigation has led. Uh, it's not, our interest is in finding out the facts of what happened, uh, not uh, taking uh, uh, what we've read in the newspaper and making bold assertions that we know what happened. Uh, we'd rather investigate it. Seem likely. I think that's, that goes back to making presumptions about what happened and we'd rather investigate it. Yes. Jay, on um, there were a fair number of questions yesterday about the Romney tape and mm -hmm. what he had to say. Um, there was a tape that the Republicans immediately tried to distribute yesterday, mm -hmm. I guess, to push back. Uh, that's fairly old, 14 years ago. The president talking about re redistribution. Uh, my question is, from a policy standpoint, the Republicans seem to be trying to use that tape to suggest that the president's goal is to redistrib redistribute income and wealth. And can you say, from a policy standpoint, whether that is a fair characterization or not? And I would say that uh, all of us uh, who follow politics and policy, whether we're on this side or, or your side of the podium, have uh, seen circumstances like this where a campaign is uh, having a very bad day or a very bad week. And in circums like that, circumstances like that, there are efforts made, uh, sometimes desperate efforts made, to change the subject. Um, you know, the, the charge based on this 14-year-old video, uh, 
sounds very familiar to one that was tried and failed in 2008. Uh, you know, 14 years ago, then Senator Obama was making uh, an argument for a more efficient, more effective government, specifically citing civil city government agencies that he did not think were working effectively. He believed then and believes now that there are steps we can take to promote opportunity and ensure that all Americans have a fair shot if they uh, work hard. Um, he certainly doesn't believe, as some apparently do, that uh, any student who looks for a government-backed loan is looking for a handout, or that a senior citizen receiving Social Security is a freeloader, uh, or a combat veteran not paying taxes uh, is a victim. He, uh, he believes that we need to make government more effective, more efficient. He believed that then, he believes it now. But when he says pull resources in that tape, that we need to pull resources, and, we, and he believes in redistribution, does that, since you're characterizing what he meant 14 years ago and with confidence, was he also suggesting he believes in redistribution of wealth? The president believes that we have to have an, a, gov a government that works efficiently and effectively uh, and uh, wisely in the use of taxpayer dollars on behalf of the American people, that advances the American economy, that uh, helps provide opportunity uh, to uh, middle class Americans and those seeking to uh, uh, enter the middle class. He certainly believes that uh, programs like Social Security and Medicare that uh, every American who works contributes to uh, are beneficial for the entire society. And those programs use money that you and I put in every week to ensure that your grandmother and my grandmother have health care now. Uh, that's a wise use of uh, government resources and, and, and uh, taxpayer dollars. But again, if you look at what he said back then, it was all about uh, his concern as a state senator with inefficient, ineffective uh, local government programs and the need to make them more efficient and more effective. And that is a, a focus and a concern that he has brought uh, here to Washington, first as a senator and now as president. And the last question. Um, beyond the attacks back and forth, the Wall Street Journal today cites U.S. Census data that says um, that in 2011, 49 percent of the population lived in a household receiving some sort of government benefits, and that uh, back in the 80s it was only 30 percent. So my question would be, do you think, since the President does talk a lot on the stump about the debt problem, mm -hmm. about balancing the budget, is that a sustainable path? to go from 30 percent to 49 percent in terms of people receiving benefits. Is that sustainable? Can you actually balance the budget if we're headed in that direction? Well, I think you have to look at what those benefits are. We obviously have grown older as a nation, and, and uh, if you're questioning whether or not uh, Social Security is a necessary and beneficial program for America's seniors, I think the President's answer would be clear. Yes, it is. Uh, is it absolutely essential that Medicare as we know it remain in place to provide uh, health care to America's seniors? Yes, it is. Are veterans benefits? And we certainly have uh, a large number of veterans and veterans who need assistance returning from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Are those benefits uh, necessary and helpful to American society? The answer absolutely is yes. Uh, again, I, you know, there have been a lot of assessments of the 47 percent figure, uh, some of them very interesting and I think substantive and worth uh, examining. You know, it, it, it was noted in a different context when we talk about uh, effective tax rates. Uh, all those hardworking Americans, everybody who pays payroll taxes is working and earning a paycheck. And a lot of them are paying a higher effective tax rate, even if their federal income tax is extremely low or zero, than some millionaires and billionaires out there because of the, uh, of the carried interest law or uh, other measures by which somebody like Warren Buffett or others can manage to pay a far lower effective tax rate than a school teacher or a bus driver or a police officer. The President believes that when we talk about tax reform, that's one of the things that we need to fix uh, so that the tax system is more fair. You use the word desperate. So the White House believes the Romney campaign has gotten desperate, you said? No, I made an observation as a keen observer of the political scene that when a campaign is having a bad day or a bad week, or some might say a bad month, uh, uh, and this has been true uh, in campaigns on, from both parties, candidates of all strikes, 
uh, you so sometimes witness an effort to, uh, it seems desperate, to change the subject. We might, be wit we might be witnessing that now, but I leave it up to the experts, uh, including you. You have further questions to Chicago, but you seem to be willing to weigh in on the campaign now. I had a four-shot espresso before I got out here. Thanks, Jay. I just want to go back to the surge for a moment. To be clear, have all of the surge forces now been withdrawn at this point? Uh, the so-called surge forces, I believe 33,000 roughly, uh, are uh, due to be fully withdrawn by the end of this month. Uh, we, I would have to check on the absolute status right now. I don't believe they're to a person completely withdrawn yet, but they are due to be withdrawn by the end of the month. So you don't have any updates about whether or not they've actually been withdrawn? I don't country. believe that every single uh, person has been withdrawn yet, but again, uh, the, the timetable is they will be uh, brought, brought out by the end of the month, and, and my understanding is I would refer you to the Pentagon for more details, but my understanding is that uh, that timetable is being met. And also, Senators McCain, Lieberman, and Graham put out a statement today saying that the uh, green on blue attacks were actually precipitated by the overly speedy drawdown of the surge troops, and they recommended the administration, quote, take a step back and reconsider withdrawing surge troops in, lights, uh, in light of these insider attacks. What is the President's reaction to that? And is this under consideration at all? We disagree. The President believes that it is absolutely essential to continue with the transition to Afghan security lead. Uh, that after a decade of war, more in Afghanistan, uh, it is time to wind down that war and to gradually transfer security responsibility to the Afghans. We have uh, expended a great deal of blood and treasure in that effort. And uh, it is through the heroic and remarkable service of our men and women in uniform in particular that uh, we are at a place now where uh, Afghan security forces have developed capabilities and have developed uh, the numbers uh, that ha allows them to <coughs> gradually take over security lead. Uh, the green on blue attacks are a, a very concerning problem and action is being taken to protect against those kinds of attacks. Uh, but it does not change the mission. The mission continues. And uh, I mean, with regard to uh, those assessments, I would simply note that when this president took office, he inherited an Afghan policy, an Afghan policy from the previous administration that was largely endorsed by some of the very same critics of the president's policy, in which there were uh, a fraction of the number of troops that this president uh, allocated to the effort in Afghanistan and, uh, and the AFPAC region. And nothing like the kind of focus on a clear mission on the disruption, dismantlement, and defeat of al-Qaeda uh, that this President has pursued. The President made clear in the 2008 campaign that we needed to refocus attention on Afghanistan, that we needed to end the war in Iraq. He has fulfilled the promise to end the war in Iraq, and he is fulfilling his promise with regards to Afghanistan. Well, if it's not linked to the drawdown of the surge forces, has the administration gotten closer to figuring out what is behind this uptick in violence? Yeah, you know, I would. Uh, for for details uh, on on this, I think the Pentagon and ISAF would be the best uh, places to go. I think one thing that I understand to be true, and that uh, is the assessment of uh, our commanders in the field, is that because of the success we've had in uh, halting the momentum of the Taliban and uh, retaking territory controlled by the Taliban. Uh, this is a tactic that is being used uh, as an alternative by the Taliban and other extremists, uh, which might argue against some of the assertions being made that you cite. Uh, but let me be clear, this is very concerning, and that is why the steps are being taken by uh, our commanders in the field, by General Allen and others. Uh, but it does not change the mission. I'm sorry, it does not change the mission. Margaret. Thanks, Jay. I wanted to ask you a couple of follow-up questions about the President's meeting with Aung San Suu Kyi later today. Um, Kim, can you talk a little bit more about what it says about how he sees her role uh, both in uh, Burma and Myanmar and also, you know, more broadly in the region that the meeting is happening? Um, and in terms of diplomacy, I know, like, if the Dalai Lama visits, the President has to kind of take considerations about how to position that vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese government. Um, 
I'm wondering how this compares. Did the U.S. give Burma a heads up? Uh, Diplomacy-wise, is there an issue or concern about that visit in terms of how the U.S. goes forward? Well, the President very much looks forward to this visit. Uh, the President views uh, Aung San Suu Kyi very much as uh, you described her, which is, uh, and I did before, which is as somebody who has been um, a remarkable uh, uh, beacon for democratic reform in her country and for her people. Uh, and uh, that struggle has lasted for many, many years. And uh, it is uh, certainly appropriate that she uh, will be receiving the Congressional Gold Medal in recognition of her uh, many year struggle in Burma, a struggle that is resulting now in her visit and, and in the remarkable reforms that have been undertaken by uh, President Thane Sein uh, in Burma. And uh, as I think we discussed the other day when I was asked about her visit and uh, reforms underway and reciprocal actions that we've been taking uh, in response to those reforms, uh, you know, a great deal has been transpiring in Myanmar, Burma, uh, and we continue to work with President Thane Sein and the government there, uh, as well as uh, others, uh, to help the cause of reform and to help the cause of uh, uh, the democratic process there. Is the visit itself this, uh, and the symbolism that that connotes what's most important, or do you expect that they're going to actually discuss anything substantive that he's asking her for information about, or, or you know, vice versa? Well, I, I don't want to you know, read out a conversation that hasn't taken place yet. I, I know he looks forward to meeting with her. He's spoken with her by phone in the past, but has not met with her. And, uh, and I'm sure there will be substantive uh, elements to the discussion. Uh, but it is certainly the case that we are engaged with the government of Myanmar uh, very actively when it comes to the reforms that uh, we have been urging them to put in place and that they have been putting in place. Mark. Um, circling back to uh, the, the video again on the Middle East, yesterday you uh, said it wasn't leadership, it was the opposite of leadership for Mitt Romney to say that um, a, a solution in the Middle East is, is an issue that should be kicked down the, down the field. Um, but, but if you look at the Obama administration's record on the Middle East uh, for at least the past 12 months, it seems as though the White House is effectively kicking it down the field as well. Um, when Senator Mitchell uh, left as special envoy, he wasn't replaced at a similar level. The President hasn't announced uh, a, a major or even modest new initiative on the Middle East since the speech he gave on the Middle East early last year. And diplomatic engagement by the U.S. on this issue is, is by all accounts, at, at a very low level. So I guess the question I'm asking is, is it fair for the White House to say that he's showing no leadership and saying he's kicking it down the field when it appears that you guys are kicking it down the field as well? Well, I would contest the premise. As you know, Mark, when this president came into office, he made this a priority. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has uh, taken steps to try to advance the peace process. Uh, and uh, this is a very, very difficult problem. There is no question, and it has been a problem uh, that previous presidents have uh, worked to resolve. And the fact that we are still short of peace does not mean we should throw up our hands and preemptively tell our supporters or tell the American people or the Israelis or the Palestinians that we're not even going to try. Now, this president's committed to uh, taking steps to move the Middle East peace process forward, to bringing the two parties uh, to the table uh, to negotiate a lasting peace. That is the only way that uh, a two-state solution can be achieved that provides the security that Israel deserves and needs and the uh, sovereignty that the Palestinian people seek. Uh, and uh, we have I would certainly not argue that we have uh, not met with the kind of success in those efforts that we all desire and we believe that the majority 
of Palestinians and Israelis desire, uh, but we will continue to work on the issue. And my point was that leadership is about acknowledging the difficulty of the challenges you face and uh, trying to tackle them. It is not uh, preemptively announcing that uh, they're too hard, so why bother? point about the difficulty of it, um, but, but I'm just wondering what evidence you can point to uh, that the President has continued to push hard on this, because if you look at it from the outside, it does appear that he's made perhaps a, a, a very valid decision, a very uh, defensible decision, that he's not going to get anywhere between now and, and the election at least, so he's chosen to put it on the back burner. Well, we continue to press both sides to come to the negotiating table to resolve these very difficult issues that uh, remain the obstacles to a lasting peace. And we have come at this problem in a variety of ways and will continue to work with uh, our international partners, with uh, the Israelis and Palestinians uh, in that effort. Uh, again, I. I concede that this is a challenge. I concede that this president, like his predecessors, so many of them have, uh, has not succeeded in helping uh, bring about that final and lasting peace between the two parties. Uh, but it is too important an issue to disregard and uh, declare unsolvable. Uh, that, the, that's n not in the interest of the United States. It's not in the interest of the Israelis, and it's not in, in the interest of the Palestinians. It, I mean, it is stated policy of both the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority that a, a two-state solution uh, should be pursued. And uh, it is certainly the policy of this administration and uh, predecessors of this administration, both Republican and Democratic, that it should be pursued. Uh, and it, it, it is the correct avenue to achieving uh, peace uh, in that region. So this president uh, will continue that effort, uh, hopefully, uh, beyond uh, January of next year, and um, you know accepts that it's a challenge, but uh, believes deeply that it's a challenge that we have to meet. Yes, Tangi. The, the French government has decided to temporarily close their embassies and schools in several Muslim countries after a satirical weekly Charlie Hebdo uh, published cartoons mocking the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, is the White House concerned that those cartoons might further find the flames in the region? Well, we are aware that a French magazine published cartoons feature, featuring a figure resembling the Prophet Muhammad, and obviously we have questions about the judgment of publishing something like this. Uh, we know that these image will be d images will be deeply offensive to many and have the potential to be inflammatory. Uh, but we've spoken repeatedly about the importance of upholding the freedom of expression that is enshrined in our Constitution. In other words, uh, we don't question the right uh, of something like this to be published. Uh, we just question the judgment behind the decision to publish it. And, and I think that that's our view about uh, the video that uh, uh, was produced in this country and, and has caused uh, uh, so much offense in the Muslim world. world. Now. It has to be said, and I'll say it again, that no matter how offensive uh, something like this is, it is not in any way justification for violence. Not in any way justification for violence. Um, now, you know, we have been staying in close touch with the French government as well as other governments around the world, and we appreciate the statements of support uh, by French government officials over the over the past week denouncing the violence against Americans and our diplomatic missions overseas. Uh, thank you. It's, it's the same, uh, same subject. Uh, earlier today in Moscow there was a minor flare-up uh, because the uh, leader of the Russian Communists, Mr. Zyuganov, uh, yeah, he was nine. Right, uh, <laughs> supp supposedly uh, said in his Twitter account something denigrating about the killed American ambassador. 
And I don't even want to go there and to repeat what he said. He denies it, by the way. Uh, but uh, the, the story was, most of the story was, that uh, it created an outrage in, Mo in, in Washington and that uh, the Americans uh, will sanction Mr. Zyuganov and, and on and on and on. My question to you is, have you heard about this? <laughs> Uh, I'm hearing about it for the first time, so I'm not aware of this report, uh, and I'm not aware of any uh, outrage here. I just it wasn't brought to my attention. Have you, have you ever heard of uh, someone being sanctioned uh, in, in a situation like this for, for uh, making a an offensive comment I have about not. an American? Again, I, 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 I have not heard of this report. I know of no basis to it. Um, that's all I know. April. Following up on that line of questioning, um, what if, if anything is the White House doing to uh, secure this homeland as skirmishes are happening overseas, this anti-American sentiment? Uh, what is the President doing and, and, and if you can tell us, what can you tell us? Well, I, I can tell you that it is a fundamental reality of uh, our contemporary life here uh, in the post 9-11 world but even prior to it that we have to be extremely vigilant and that vigilance continues. I have no uh, specific briefing to give to you about uh, actions taken in the wake of the protests and unrest in the Middle East uh, uh, but I can assure you that our security uh, team and our counterterrorism specialists are, uh, as they always are, extremely vigilant about uh, potential threats against the United States here uh, and against Americans here in the country. Now also, the President, the first president, he did this Muslim outreach, and he did it just for this reason, to, to quell any kind of anti-American concern. Is there a thought around the White House, or are there conversations among senior staffers that they, that may need to happen again to, to, to do some kind of outreach so that this kind of anti-American sentiment will not cause more problems than what's going on right now? Well, I, I wouldn't put it that way, April. I would simply say that uh, I remember well, since I covered it, that President Bush, uh, in the immediate aftermath of the terrible, devastating attacks on 9-11, uh, spoke very clearly about the fact that uh, we would not be and were not at war with Islam. Uh, and that remains the case. And I think that's a message that this President has carried uh, from the beginning of his administration, in echoing the very same sentiments that President Bush uh, put forward in the wake of 9-11. We have made clear, the President has, Secretary Clinton, Ambassador Rice, even the press secretary, that we find the uh, video uh, that has uh, been so offensive to Muslims uh, to be uh, disgusting and reprehensible and not something that in any way represents the values or the beliefs of the American people. And we have made clear that obviously the American government had nothing to do with it. Uh, we make the additional point, and it is an important point, that no matter how offensive such a video is, uh, there is no justification for violence. There is no justification for uh, attacking and killing innocent people. In this case, in Benghazi, innocent Americans, including an ambassador who had done so much to help the Libyan people and to help them uh, emerge from the shadow of tyranny under Mu uh, Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, and, and that is a message that uh, needs to be very clear as well. So any investigations about all the skirmishes and, and the initial skirmish that happened in Libya, is it, has it been concluded that this was linked to trying to show America something on 9-11, show anti-American sentiment for 9-11? Is that? I've had a, April, I've had a lot of questions about what we know about uh, what precipitated the attacks in Benghazi, and I, and I said earlier and have said in, uh, on previous days that uh, based on the information we have now, we don't uh, have evidence that it was uh, premeditated or preplanned. Uh, it is certainly the case that there are uh, 
uh, a number of uh, uh, bad actors and, and armed uh, groups uh, of extremists in Libya uh, who uh, might take advantage of a situation that was brought about initially as a response to the, uh, the video in question. But this is under active investigation, and we uh, await the results of that investigation by the FBI before we can reach uh, any firm conclusions about what precipitated the attacks. Right now, I'm saying we don't have evidence uh, at this point that this was premeditated or preplanned uh, to coincide on a to happen on a specific date or coincide with that anniversary. If that changes, we will certainly uh, make you aware of it. Thanks, Jay. Thanks very much.